just just a quick announcement because we have a lot of people here so please family sit together okay and also put on your mask if you can please and sit family sit together so we'll just do nursing in their prayer so much you want
the spiritual world, you, you see these places where you know, horrible. <laughs> so Krishna said, no, you go, you write some books, and I'll protect you. So Baba said, okay, because Krishna really wanted me to go and do this for him. And it was time. It was time knowing that Kali Yuga would be accelerated. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's prophecy of every town and village had began in a very uh, small, incremental way when Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared in 1486. So nothing really happened until Bhakti Vinod Thakur started to glorify and publish books around the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. There was that famous book, it, the Teachings and Precepts of Lord Chaitanya. And that book was published and distributed in the year 1896. Bhakti Vinod Thakur had written that book, compiled it. And it was just 96 pages, maybe not, a little bit more than almost 100 pages. And he decided to take that book and he found some of the major universities around the world. And he mailed that book to these universities. Leipzig University in Germany, I believe Oxford University here, and also McGill University in Canada. And that's where the devotees had actually found that book. <laughs> and they, the library party was traveling around and they actually came across that book, The Teachings and Precepts of Lord Chaitanya. And it's interesting because Prabhupada appeared in that same year. So when the book appeared, the person who would take that the message of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared in the same same year. So that's not coincidence. So Krishna is orchestrating this whole Krishna consciousness movement. Actually Lord Chaitanya is the orchestrator and he's pushing it. And it's prophesized every town and village. And Srila Prabhupada was the person who pushed it forward in a very strong way. When Srila Prabhupada was asked, you know, Mahaprabhu was here, Mali was here, he spread Krishna consciousness all throughout the subcontinent of India. And why didn't he, uh, you know, just take it all around the world? He was God and he already started it. And Prabhupada said, he left it for me to do. <laughs> and this is because that's one of the qualities of Krishna. He likes to empower his devotees to do great things. And he does the empowerment, and he actually orchestrates the whole thing. And then what happens? The devotee gets the credit. <laughs> that's Krishna. He's behind the scenes doing everything. And the devotee apparently does the work with the empowerment of Krishna. And then Krishna gives them the credit. That's Krishna. Some people say, you know, what's Krishna like? Well, that's Krishna. <laughs> he likes to empower his devotees to do things, and then when the devotee is glorified, Krishna is happy. That's it. That's Krishna. He has great love for his devotee. He likes to see his devotees become, you know, glorified. And so Srila Prabhupada came at a time when people were really kind of rejecting the modern social, political, and just general way of life. I call it the hippie movement. In the 1950s, it started with the beatnik movement in America. And then it spread throughout the world. It became even very popular in Europe and places like Amsterdam and London and a few other places. And people were, young people, were rejecting the social, political, and familial values that they had grown up with and saying, well, we don't want any of this stuff. <laughs> Just, we want to be free. We don't want to you know, follow what you, you know, your whole life is you just simply work hard to make money. Life is for enjoyment. <laughs> it was kind of like a bohemian type of response to, you know, the social and political mood. And people were just, you know, the, the, 
message was tune in, turn on, drop out. <laughs> and it was all about psychedelic drugs. <laughs> so psychedelic drugs, free sex, uh, what else? You know, long hair, don't take a bath. <laughs> really? I mean, some of the devotees that joined that movement, there was one who hadn't taken a bath in, in a month. So he wasn't so socially, you know, favorable, but we had some compassionate devotees that brought him in, gave him a bath, and there's a few left, huh? I don't want to name names. <laughs> so that was the movement. Prabhupada kind of picked up people from all sectors of life, and mostly from this movement, and rejecting everything. And they had, a, they had a, the tendency to look towards Eastern philosophy, Eastern culture, Eastern lifestyle as an alternative. And so there were a lot of yoga came in, Cardinal reincarnation, you know, various kind of philosophical books about you know, the importance of spirituality from all sectors of society. If it was different, it was good. It had to be different. So Prabhupada came at that time. And because someone asked Prabhupada, why didn't you come earlier? Prabhupada said, you weren't ready for me. <laughs> but the time was right. And there was a class of people that were ready to go forward and look and do something different, do something new. And they were intelligent. Many of them were college graduates. Many of them had some positions previously and had left all that just to live a very freestyle life. And when they when Prabhupada came, you know, in New York and then San Francisco, Los Angeles, he came at the time when this this what we say rejection of all social and family values was at its height. And he was able to pick up people who, and they immediately joined his movement and chanted Hare Krishna and started to become actually what we say, nice people. <laughs> they were already nice, but at the same time, there was a lot of rough edges. <laughs> so uh, that so Prabhupada came. And that's how he built his movement. Prabhupada even said, I came to look for some first-class men. I couldn't find any. <laughs> I wanted some first-class, maybe second-class, no first-class, no second-class. Mostly third and fourth class. Oh, one first class. And he mentioned Sri Brahmana Goswami, because he was a professor, not a professor, a student of biology in uh, the HJU University in Southern California. And he was very intelligent from Mayapur, and he came to Prabhupada, Prabhupada really. And he had this scientific acumen that Prabhupada used to preach in the scientific way. And, uh, Prabhupada used him to spread Krishna consciousness to the scientific community. So Prabhupada, you know, he had a deal with people who were quite hard to control, <laughs> to say the least, that's an understatement. Impossible to control, I think that's a better word. So Prabhupada did it, and he somehow put it all together. When people would ask him, you know, uh, what is your success? He said, I've taken hippies and I've made them happy. <laughs> I've turned hippies into happy. And then someone asked, well, what is a hippie? And Prabhupada said, something very extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> and then someone asked again, and Prabhupada said, you know better than I do. <laughs> So this is the type of people who were the beginning of our Krishna consciousness movement. And because of Prabhupada, they changed. They actually became, you know, Vaishnavas in the real sense of the word. I mean, their habits, our habits, as you should say, are, instead of their, our habits were not so, what we say, sutra, or following the principles, but there was a strong, strong undercurrent of wanting to serve Prabhupada and reading the books, going out on Shankatan, distributing prasadam, just doing the simple basic things that make up our movement. And there was a different, there was an inundation of that. 
and the Krishna consciousness spreads so fast, especially in America in those days, that there was one one uh, senator from Congress in America who's on record as saying, if this this Hare Krishna movement continues to spread the way it is, in ten years it'll take over the government. <laughs> that it was it was like wildfire. Devotees were being made by the hundreds, you know, every year, hundreds and hundreds of devotees were coming. Temples were opening, books were being published, and uh, the movement was really moving fast. Then it went into Europe. London was the first place, then Germany, and then various other places. And Prabhupada, then Prabhupada wanted to bring the, what he called uh, dancing white elephants back to India, because he felt that the Indian society was going away from their culture, their tradition, their philosophy, and was adopting the Western way. So Prabhupada brought us back, and he called us the dancing white elephants. <laughs> we were pretty big, so we <laughs> And the idea was to show the Indian people, this is what you're chasing after. These people had it all. They had money. They had you know, good families. They had a lot of everything that you're looking for. So they gave it up. And they're doing, they're, they're, they're actually showing you what your culture is. And that helped a lot because a lot of the young, intelligent Indian boys who somehow came in contact with our movement joined, such as Look at Our Swami and uh, uh, many, many other people came from, in our early days. So many. Think, yeah, many of the Indian sannyasis and others came. And Prabhupada showed, yeah, this is what you're rejecting. But they, these people are enthusiastically chanting, dancing. They may not have so many good habits. <laughs> we didn't know all the fuchi muchi stuff. <laughs> but we, Prabhupada was willing to be patient and, and somehow teach us like that. So, you know. Another Yogendra Swami, he was one of the first also, joined the Prabhupada in, in India Bay. So, and then Prabhupada's movement just started to spread like wildfire. And then the temples were opening, and devotees were being made, books were being published. And, and Prabhupada was so enthusiastic to continue to push our movement. Um, we accidentally learned how book distribution could actually be a really viable means to preach. Two devotees, this was in 1970. At that time, we only had Bhagavad Gita. I'm not sorry, not Bhagavad Gita. But we had uh, Back to Godhead magazine. The Gita was published also in a very small, compact version. And then Prabhupada put out the Krishna book. That was in 1970. And there were two devotees driving in the car. They had one Krishna book in their car. They went to a, a gas station to get gas. And then in those days, you know, the, ga the man who runs the gas he comes out, he throws the car up, and then he says, that'll be that much money. So he came out, filled the car up, and asked for some money. And the devotees looked, they had no money. <laughs> the gas was already in the car. So the devotees thought, well, maybe we can give him a Krishna book. So he showed him this book and preached a little bit about, you know, Krishna and the Supreme Lord. And said, could you take this and, you know, in exchange for the gas? The man said, no. <laughs> and that word got back to Prabhupada and the other devotees. And then they thought, huh, you know, we can actually distribute these books in public. And that started a wave of starting to go out on the streets and distributing books. And that idea came from that one incident. And then it started to spread more and more. And the devotees were distributing thousands and thousands of books, especially during Christmas. And Prabhupada would always say, double it. He would say, we, you know, you did, you did like 1.5 million books in 1973. Let's, you have to do 3 million in 1974. And it was like that. So we, we would double it. We actually did double it every year. And Prabhupada would say, okay, now double it again. 
This went on until 1976. The books were going on. Today, we're one of the biggest book distributors in the world. Uh, we have almost 600 million books that have been recorded in terms of distribution. How much of the books that are not being recorded? So, yeah, our society is really famous for book distribution. And Prabhupada understood that because he, his guru, Maharaj Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, told him in 1936 when they were at Radha Kunt, if you ever get money, print books. He said, the Madanga drum, when it's played, it can be heard from a certain distance. But the printing press is the Brihat Madanga. It can go everywhere. And we, the, whole ya the whole Russian yatra, I mean, it, it is the biggest yatra outside of India, the, the Russian yatra. There are tens and thousands, I should say even a more than 100,000 devotees in Russia, all over the Russian, former Russian Soviet bloc. And how did they get in? The books, there was, it was really strict communism at the time. Shama Sindhu and Prabhupada, received, Prabhupada received an invitation to go to one Vedic society to speak on behalf of Vedic culture in Russia at the time of communism. So Prabhupada took it as an opportunity to go. And you couldn't bring any books there. But what Malati did, Malati, the wife of Sham Sundar, she put a book in Sham Sundar's suitcase. And the idea was no books go in, because if they catch you with books, they could use it well. They could also put you in jail, confiscate, and you know, penalize you strongly and everything. They would immediately throw you out of the country. Mm -hmm. That would be at least the thing they do. No religious books were allowed. So they went in, and then they were going through customs. So Shamasinda had to open up his suitcase. And when the man was looking, the immigration officer, he saw, what is this? He picks up the Gita. And Malti had stuck all these papers and pictures inside the pages. So when he picked it up, all of them started to flow out. <laughs> so the man got a little, what we say, ruffled. And he, was, he, he put the book down, he started picking up all the papers, you know, because he felt like he did something wrong. And he put it all back in the book, and he handed the book back. <laughs> <laughs> and that book got in. And that, was a, that book, when it got in, Later, after Prabhupada had been there for a while, one of the devotees became interested in Krishna consciousness. What was his name? Shanti? Ananta Shanti. Yeah, Ananta Shanti. And he arranged for that book to get copied. Because you, you couldn't go on pr printing press. He said he would hand copy the book. So we write page by page in the Gita, Prabhupada's Gita. And then someone would get an out that copy and then they would, someone else would copy that copy, and that's how book distribution developed in, in Russia. And people were spending, like, their whole month's salary just to get a body of Gita. Because the thirst for spirituality was really strong in, in Russia, because it had been, you know, restricted for so many decades. And now people want, when they came across Krishna consciousness, so a lot of underground work was going on. The boys were just writing books and distributing. And gradually the, the Russian Yatra started to break because of that. More and more people came. Now it's the biggest Yatra outside of India. Hundreds, more than 100,000 devotees in Russia throughout the entire Russian block, we say, let's say, even today. So you can see the power of book distribution. And Prabhupada pushed that out. His main teaching, Harinam and book distribution. These are the two things that he wanted emphasis upon. And of course, then he also said prasadam distribution. So uh, that's our movement. And it's still very much the way to spread Krishna consciousness. And even Prabhupada. Prabhupada was one of the first book distributors. When he came to America in 1965, Prabhupada had those 
Srimad Bhagavatam, the ones that you see, the old ones, where a lot of the words are spelled wrong. And Prabhupada had 200 sets of the first three volumes of the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. And he was thinking, how can I get these books out? So he was going to bookstores, Prabhupada himself, and asking the booksellers, you know, trying to convince them to take the book. But most of them were saying, people are not interested in these books. <laughs> so they really didn't take it. And so one time Prabhupada saw this store, which was a combination. It had some books, but it was a clothing store. Prabhupada went in. And uh, he showed the man the book. The man really wasn't interested. And uh, and uh, so Prabhupada said, "All right, you don't have to pay me anything for the book. You just take the book, consignment, and if it sells, you give me something." And the man said, "All right, but these books don't sell." <laughs> so he took it anyway. And then Prabhupada came back the next day. Did the book sell? The man said, you just came yesterday. <laughs> I told you these books don't sell. And Prabhupada left. And Prabhupada came back the next day. <laughs> and the man was a little bit more irritated now. <laughs> and then he, there was some table there, so Prabhupada sat down at the table. And he said to the man, get me a glass of water. And the man said, you, the water's over there. <laughs> but his wife was there. And she said, he wants a glass of water. Get him some water. <laughs> you know, it's the benefit of having a wife. They know what to do. <laughs> Husbands get confused sometimes. <laughs> and uh, so she, he got him a glass of water. He drank the, the glass of water. Prabhupada drank half the glass of water, get up, got up and left, and the next day the book sold. You see the connection? He did some service for a great soul. As soon as he did some service, although he did it reluctantly, he still did something. The book sold the next day. So yeah, that's how that's what Prabhupada had to go through to start distribution in America, you know. And Prabhupada living in America was very awkward. You know, he didn't know the America culture. <laughs> when someone asked Gandhi, what do you think about Western culture? Gandhi said, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> There's no culture. <laughs> and so Prabhupada came, and he used to go to these little, what you like, little stores, they were like little tiny super supermarkets, you know. So And they'd have the little basket, and you roll it around. So Prabhupada went shopping one day, and he put some items in the basket, and then he came to the checkout counter, and he put it on it, and the lady, you know, she punched in the numbers for each item, and she said, that'll be $11.55. Prabhupada said, I'll give you five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> she said, "Excuse me, sir, but it, the, the price is eleven fifty-five. Papa said it's only worth five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> you know the Indian. <laughs> you, 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 you barter <laughs> when you make a purchase in India. <laughs> you never take the whatever the man says. You barter, and then you get you find some somewhere. So that was Papa." <laughs> And so, finally, the lady liked them at Prabhupada so much, so she, she took Prabhupada's five dollars and paid the rest out of her own pocket. <laughs> Somehow, Prabhupada was just so attractive that she couldn't refuse. <laughs> she told that story later to the devotees. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, Prabhupada had a hard time coming to India. There was a story where when Prabhupada was, he was staying at Sally Agarwal's house in Pennsylvania. That was the first 
place to stay. And so, you know, in India, when you take a bath, you fill up a bucket and you take a, a lot and you throw it over. So Prabhupada thought that's what you do in America, too. So you fill up the bathtub and you stay in the house. And then Sally, she's watching water coming out the bathroom with the bathroom door from underneath. She's wondering what's happening to my bathroom. So Prabhupada, you know, he was traditional. Stay, go, go inside the bathtub. It's dirty, you know. You have to sit in your own dirt now. <laughs> taking a bath. <laughs> and then she took him to the laundromat. And, you know, probably never, because probably, you know, the idea is that so you take your own. You say, whatever you want to wash, I put it on the rug and squeeze it on the rug. <laughs> and he's right, that's India. <laughs> So we took them to the laundry mat to show how we wash clothes in the rush. We probably put them all in the kitchen. He wasn't so much impressed probably when we wash the dishes. I took him a little while to get accustomed. And the first time when he was there, when there was snow, Prabhupada had gone to rest one night, but he woke up. He looked out the window and there was snow. Every time you move around, you must be very popular because everybody watches you. Sorry, Maharaj. In, 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 in the YouTube uh, live, they can't hear. So that's why trying to adjust the volume. but. Unfortunately, you have to wear it around your neck. So, so, they, so, so they can hear. Sorry. So we give life to YouTube. <laughs> okay. So this is good. I like it. It's very stylish. <laughs> Don't take any pictures. <laughs> Prabhupada was, uh, yeah, he, he, he went to rest one night, and when he got up, it had snow that night, and he looked out, and there, when he looked out, the buildings in, in New York are really close together, so he could see the snow on the next building, and he thought, somebody painted the building white overnight, <laughs> <laughs> and he realized it was snow. <laughs> Prabhupada had a little hard time in the very beginning getting adjusted to the Western culture. Sumati Morariji, who sponsored Prabhupada's ticket, she didn't want him to go. She told him, it's cold, and what will you eat there? <laughs> You're all by yourself. You'll die. She told him that you'll die. <laughs> but Prabhupada didn't care. He wanted to go. That was his mission to spread Krishna. What Prabhupada had to do to spread Krishna consciousness cannot be ever duplicated again. He s had so many obstacles, so many difficulties, so many reverses, and especially training us. When Prabhupada started 26th Second Avenue, and he was having all these hippies come in, he was giving Bhagavad Gita class three nights a week. And uh, he would also serve out prasadam, too. Prabhupada would cook, and then he would, you know, cook, and then he would give the lecture, and Prabhupada would serve the prasadam. He never asked all these new people to do anything. He did everything himself. And then after they would finish, that would be the last thing, and then they would leave, and Prabhupada would clean up. He would do the cleaning. So one day... When Prabhupada was cleaning up, two boys, they stood behind and they said, they used to call him Swamiji. Swamiji, can we help you clean? Prabhupada said, I was hoping somebody would ask. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, he, he, wait, he didn't ask the devotees to do anything in those days. He just did it himself. And then, then the devotees gradually started to understand 
what it means to be to what it means to be in association with a saintly person. We didn't know much about saintly persons. We heard, we read books, but that's about all. And there was one Prabhupada was giving a lecture one time, and you know this is on the street, and there's all these derelicts and drunkards and bums we call them. They just lay on the street, and all they do is drink wine. And their life is from one bottle to another. So one Papa was giving a lecture one time, and one bum dra staggered into the <laughs> into the room where Papa was speaking, and he had a roll of toilet paper, <laughs> and he came. He walked right over to the bathroom, put the roll of toilet paper in, and he did some gestures, and then he left. Papa said, "His spiritual life has begun. <laughs> he has done some seva." <laughs> yeah. So Prabhupada acknowledged the, this man, although he had no understanding what he was doing, he wanted to gift something. So Prabhupada accepted that as something nice, something really wonderful. And that's what it was like in those days, very simple. And Prabhupada would go out in the streets and with his little drum, and he had the tom-tom drum, one-headed drum, just like the, something like what you have, but it was a I mean, it was just like that, but it was a canvas cover, and it was a wooden, you know, like that. And Prabhupada would use that for kirtan, and that's all he had. There was no cartels, there was nothing, just that little drum. And he would just play the drum and sing Hare Krishna, and then the new people who were coming, they would go out. They never thought they would do it in the streets. Prabhupada shocked everybody. They were doing it inside the the buildings, they, but then they took it out in the streets. They thought, what is this? <laughs> but Prabhupada showed. And then, uh, you know, more and more people started to come because we were out in the streets. And publicity came, and and then devotees. And many, many people were coming. So many devotees. Prabhupada attracted the most interesting and such a, a large variety from so many backgrounds of people. People from the streets that had no education. You know, then you had Howard Wheeler, later became Haya Griever. He was an English professor at the, the University of Ohio. Srub Damodar was a biology student, very intellectual. And we had all kinds of people coming to our movement. And Prabhupada dealt with all that but he had to teach all of us, you know, Krishna consciousness. And that was that was difficult. Uh, there was one story where when Mukunda came, Mukunda writes about this in his book Twenty Six Second Ave. I think the the, the the title of the book. And uh, so Prabhupada was there, and Mukunda was there. They were in a car together. And Prabhupada had a date, you know, one of these dates. So he bit the date, and he gave it to Mukunda. <laughs> and Mukunda's thinking, what is this? He, he, he bites it, and then he's giving it to me? <laughs> when he thought, well, maybe this is what you're supposed to do. So he took a bite, and he handed it back to Prabhupada. <laughs> 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 Your turn. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, that's okay. <laughs> So you, you, this is what Prabhupada had to go through to spread the movement. <laughs> and you talk about a, a you know a very cultural aristocratic personality like Prabhupada. Prabhupada was very aristocratic, extremely, and he was dealing with you know us. <laughs> but you know he, this he said, this is all Krishna sent me. <laughs> so whatever Krishna sent me, I had to. You know. But. One of the things he liked, he said, and he would always say that, they, the Westerners, they're not attached to their families. And he said, because of that, it was easy for them to come to Krishna consciousness. Because, you know, the Indian families are very strong. I mean, they're very, you know, the, the kid can only be a devotee when he's like 75, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He has to go to school, get an education, get married, make money, have about six kids, <laughs> and all have. And then, when they're all the kids are grown up, 
then he can go. <laughs> I hope I didn't say anything wrong. <laughs> there was one devotee who joined the, the Brahmachari Ashram in uh, in Chaupadi. And he was a young boy, you know. And they were, you know, he had dropped out of college and came into me. So his mother, she became upset. My son is now becoming a Hare Krishna. He's going to be a failure in life. <laughs> So she came into the ashram and she was like really emotional, making a big seat in front of everybody, trying to get her son to come back. And he wasn't going to come back. So she saw this light. We had this light hanging from the ceiling. And it was an open socket. There was no bulb. And she said, if you don't come back, I'm going to stick my finger in there. <laughs> in other words, she was threatening suicide. <laughs> so her son got nervous. Everybody else did. So the boy went home. And then after some time, he came back again. <laughs> and she came again, same scene. And she again threatened the same way. And everybody didn't do anything. <laughs> Neither did she. <laughs> so. so this is what like, you know, sometimes, you know, we had so many problems trying to capture the kids from the families. <laughs> it was difficult. The problem I like the West, he said, they don't have any sp family ties there. <laughs> so that was you know, a whole different thing. And he said, because of that, I was able to build our movement like that. So that was, that was the West. Uh, yeah. So some are very interesting. One of my favorite stories, which has a really powerful message to it, of the life of Srila Prabhupada. The Prabhupada would come from wherever he was and he would fly in and the devotees would always come to the airport and the whole temple would come. Maybe le they left one devotee back to manage the temple and everyone would come and they would come with kirtan. So they would come into the airport and then they would watch the passengers deplaning and they would look for Prabhupada. As soon as they saw Prabhupada, the whole place erupted into this really big kirtan <laughs> in the middle of the airport. Because <laughs> the airports were kind of like public places and there was no restrictions then. <laughs> now it's different. So this would happen all the time. And Shruti Kirti Prabhu, he tells the story that, uh, you know, when he was traveling, he'd come with Prabhupada, and he's this one time when the devotees greeted Prabhupada, there was such happiness and enthusiasm, that, and the devotees were crying. And when they saw Prabhupada, they just broke into tears, so happy. And just when Prabhupada had that spiritual power, and you just saw him, your, your heart would just like become overwhelmed with spiritual energy. And some of them would actually roll on the ground <laughs> and cry. And it was just an emotional scene with a kirtan. So Sruti Kirti was noticing, noticing that. So they went back to where Prabhupada was staying. And then he had to give Prabhupada a massage. So he was massaging Prabhupada. It was just before lunch. And he, he decided to ask Prabhupada. He said, Prabhupada, you know, I see all my god brothers and god sisters. Boy, they have so much love for you. But I don't feel like that. And he was waiting for Prabhupada to say something. Prabhupada remained quiet. <laughs> didn't say a word. And then he remained quiet for the rest of the massage. Didn't say anything. Then it was time for, for lunch. So Sruti Kirti had to go and arrange for Prabhupada's lunch to come. Prabhupada took his afternoon bath and got changed clothes and got ready for lunch. And so Shruti Kirti now had the lunch. And so he brought it in. And Prabhupada would eat lunch alone. He would always like to eat alone because he said, Prashadam is Krishna and we should honor Krishna in a meditative way. So, and I, even, I was in Los Angeles and, and they showed me where Prabhupada used to take Prashadam was in the corner facing the wall. <laughs> he would face the wall so he could simply absorb himself. But there were certain occasions when there were special guests and he would 
you know, entertain the guests during prasadam. But that was rare. So Prabhupada was there, and he'd have a bell. And then he'd ring his bell, and then the, the servant would come in. So Shruti Kirti came in, brought the plate in. And then Prabhupada would take prasadam, and when he was done, he would ring for the servant to come in. So Shruti Kirti, and Prabhupada taught the devotee thing, when you come in, you pay obeisances, when you leave, you pay obeisances. So when he was paying obeisances to leave, in Mexico and we were going into the outer regions of the area into the villages we knocked on one door 
And when, when the door opened, and there was this lady there, and as soon as she saw this, she said, oh, Hare Krishna, come on in. <laughs> so she came, they came in, and they noticed in their house she had, she had pictures of Prabhupada and mostly pictures of Krishna all around. And it was the same lady who was the stewardess. Yeah. Simply by taking those remnants of a great soul, it changed her whole life. She actually became... Now she didn't meet. That was the first time she met devotees after that incident on the plane. She never went to any temple or anything. Somehow she, she just, I don't know, <laughs> from the remnants of a, they say three powerful substances: the water that washes the feet of the pure devotee, the dust from his lotus feet, and the maha maha prasadam. When Prabhupada's here, when sometimes the devotees would give Prabhupada a plate and then he would give it to his servants to distribute it and they would hide the plate. <laughs> and they would eat it all themselves. Because <laughs> it, it says it says in the Shastras, somehow or other, get Maha Maha, you know, because it's really powerful. <laughs> and one time, there's, and this is, this is another interesting story of Prabhupada. In the evening times, Prabhupada would give, would, would give darshan, so many of his disciples would come, and Prabhupada would speak about something. And then at the end, they would come in with a big maha plate. And then Prabhupada would take a few things from different places, and he gave it to his servant, and then they would distribute it to all the devotees. So when they would distribute it, the devotees would say, I want that, <laughs> I want that. So they would choose. So Prabhupada saw that. So one time, time he said to the district, you just take it and you mix it all together. Whatever, just make one, you know, one prep. <laughs> See, whatever it was, you know, you mix the sweet rice with the dal, you know. <laughs> and then you distribute it like that. <laughs> he was teaching that Maha uh, is absolute and you don't have to choose. <laughs> It's all absolute. So that was a nice instruction. I don't think we followed that though so much. We still have our choices. It's after six. Do I have to stop? Oh, oh I'm I'm okay, but I don't know what what the program here is. Relaxed. Okay. All right. I, I was just thinking of telling some Prabhupada stories. There's so many Prabhupada stories. There was one girl, she came to Prabhupada. She was a man-hater. She hated men. Ah, oh, men. <laughs> <laughs> and she joined the Hare Krishna movement. And then, and then she was there for a little while. After some time she came to Prabhupada, she said, I can't worship that man, Krishna. <laughs> Prabhupada said, that's okay, Radharani's higher. <laughs> <laughs> and she liked that, so. <laughs> yeah, Prabhupada had to deal with things like that. And there was one man, he joined the ashram, and he was gay. <laughs> so the boy, the devotees didn't know where to, where, how to facilitate him. You know, if you put him in the men's ashram, it's not really good. So they wrote to Prabhupada, what should we do with him? Prabhupada said, you choose one ashram, either the men's or the women's, but he can't change. <laughs> <laughs> he has to stay where he is. <laughs> These are true stories. <laughs> Trying to manage this movement in those days was really difficult. Because you know, the idea is he didn't want to reject anyone. And in those days, you know, we didn't have any movement outside of the temples in those days. There was no congregation in the early days. The congregation came much later. Krishna consciousness was a completely temple-based society for many years. And there was one time when, this happened somewhere in Europe, there was one lady, she came from the outside and she came to the temple. And she... You know, she was who she was, <laughs> and she would wear a mini skirt, and she had her hair 
up and all kinds of makeup. So she came. And the devotee said to her, well, you know, you're welcome here, but you can't come in like that. It's not nice. So, you know, she left. And then she came back again, same way. <laughs> and they told her again. This time they was a little stronger. And then, but she was attached. And so, again, so this time when she was told, they, the devotees got really heavy with her and told her you can't come back unless you, you know, dress proper. So she just thought, well, I'm not going anymore. And right around that time, Prabhupada was scheduled to come. So she had, she knew about Prabhupada. She thought, I'm going to go and see their guru. And it was a Sunday program. Prabhupada had come. So uh, Prabhupada was there first. And then she walked in, same way, hair up with mini skirt, came down. You know, you try, you try to sit down in a mini skirt. You know, it's like, <laughs> and there, was not, there wasn't any chairs there, you know. <laughs> so, so she's looking for a seat. And before she sits down, Prabhupada looks and he says, Oh, thank you for coming. You look very nice today. <laughs> Prabhupada said that to her. And she's, like, she melted her heart and she, she became so like, Wow, the guru was really nice. <laughs> and, then, and, you know, the devotees had been really having her out. Probably she was almost gone, but, but because of Prabhupada's appearance there, and that night she went home, and she took off her makeup and got rid of all of it. And she said, "If this pleases the, the devotees, then I'll do it." And that was Prabhupada, yeah. That was Prabhupada. He didn't see the body; he saw the soul. We were looking at the body here. Yeah. And Prabhupada was like that. I mean, Prabhupada had to go through a lot of stuff. <laughs> I don't know if I should tell you this story. <laughs> well, but, no, no, I don't think I better tell you this story. <laughs> we'll pass that one up. <laughs> well, there's so many interesting events in Prabhupada's life that was just how Prabhupada dealt with all these, these difficulties because preaching in the Royal West was really hard. <laughs> it wasn't easy to train Westerners to become Vaishnavas. <laughs> we liked the Hare Krishna mantra. We liked, we definitely liked prasadam. Devotees would eat so much in those days. Whew! It was like Sunday feast, you know, two, three huge plates, pile it on. Malpura and puris, Sweet rice, halava, pakoras, chutney, pushpan rice. All, I mean, the prashadam in those days was really good. I mean, really good. <laughs> really good. <laughs> really good. <laughs> and, you know, devotees would eat so much, you know, like that. Uh, we had one devotee. I, I, my, my history was New Vrindavan. And this devotee, we called him the Prashadam addict. <laughs> one time he ate 70 chapatis. <laughs> Seriously. Seven zero. <laughs> two, two gallons, gallons three and a half liters, two gallons of sweet rice in one sitting. Really? You th he, didn't, he, he didn't get sick either. I mean, I mean prashadam was a big thing. We had, we had our famous Glubjamin eating contest. I don't know if you ever heard of those. We would, devotees in different temples would have competition who could eat the most Glubjamins. And they weren't the small ones. They were like, you know, the, the big ones. So there was a big competition in one of our temples in America, St. Louis Temple. And Bhakti, uh, Bhakti Tirtaswami, who was Ganesham at the time, he was in the competition. 
So they were going back and forth. One time I entered into a Globjam meeting contest. I ate 34 Globjamers, but that wasn't, that was like, you know, this like little league. <laughs> <laughs> so in this particular competition, uh, it was tied at 86. Bhakti. <laughs> 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 Tirtha Swami had eaten, eating 86 and his other one 86. It was really tense. Who's going to win? <laughs> so this other devotee thought, I'm going to win. So not only am I going to win, I'm going to really win. So he went to 88. <laughs> but guess what happened? You can guess. <laughs> so Bhakti Tirtha Swami won <laughs> by default. <laughs> The devotee was out cold. <laughs> he was, you know, he lost, but because he couldn't hold it. <laughs> that's that's a lot. <laughs> Whoa, I mean, that's like drinking alcohol. <laughs> it's like <laughs> so. We used to eat and have you know, glove gym and eating contests and stuff like that. And prasadam was rare in those days in New Vrindavan. You'd only get uh, Maha Prashadam. I mean, we'd get regular Prashadam. But the regular Prashadam was kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> and Maha, everyone would look for Maha Prashadam. But Maha Prashadam was only, re only served at Mongol right after, for breakfast, right after breakfast. And, uh, and so devotees really wanted Maha, so we had a Maha cabinet. It was a cabinet where we keep the maha locked, and it had a padlock on it because <laughs> we we knew that. But there were devotees, and we had a door on it, and it was like a s rectangular cabinet with a padlock. And the devotees would pull the bottom of the door open with their hands and stick their hand in and grab it, whatever maha they could. <laughs> and then we decided to put some nails inside, so if you reached in, it was like Agasura. <laughs> Agasura. But that didn't discourage anybody. <laughs> and so we got a refrigerator, and we put a lock around it with a chain. But somebody stole the whole refrigerator <laughs> and took it out in the woods. And we were doing construction at the time, so we, we used to use dynamite. So they took dynamite and blew up with the lock. <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> so the idea is, what should we do to stop it? So the leader thought, we got so many ladies that need husbands, and the men don't want to get married. So the idea was, if you got caught stealing maha, you had to get married. <laughs> that was the penalty. <laughs> Really, yeah. and so every Sunday there was at least two or three marriages. <laughs> <laughs> really solved the Brahmacharini problem. <laughs> but there was one devotee; he kept getting caught stealing maha because he wanted to get caught because he wanted to get married. <laughs> so everybody figured out his program, <laughs> so they wouldn't give him a wife because <laughs> they thought, well, you know. He wants to get married, and that's not an idea. The idea is it's a punishment. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so they thought, well, we're going to really you know, teach him a lesson. So there was one girl nobody would marry. <laughs> In fact, nobody would even go near her. Every, she would scare everybody. You know? <laughs> so they thought that would be the perfect wife. <laughs> So they married her to him. <laughs> uh, about, I don't know, about the year two, 1999 when I was in Chicago, that same girl came and I was there and I met her and I said, oh, Rajeshwari, so nice to see you after so many, I didn't know, I was just being polite. <laughs> so nice to see you. Oh, Hare Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, well, what happened to your husband? <laughs> He's gone. 
<laughs> and she had a daughter already. So I said, she said, you know, I really never knew my father. <laughs> so it was like, like that. Krishna is now becoming a little bit more <laughs> organized. <laughs> but that's what it was like in the old days. Here's a nice story. This is a little humorous story. And one devotee, just recently, this is like within the last couple of years. Because uh, sometimes when the, you get a new devotee in the temple, to train them up, they send them out on book distribution right away. And we give them a little, you know, you know, austerity. So they sent this boy out on book distribution. And so he's out there, and he gives, he meets one man, he gives him a book, and the man looks at the book, and he turns on the back, and he sees a picture of Prabhupada. It says, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta, Swami. So the man turns to the book, to boy, the book distributor, what does A.C. mean? And he said, always cool. <laughs> <laughs> And the man thought, that's pretty good, you know. <laughs> he liked that. <laughs> the boy didn't really know. <laughs> he just thought this might sound good, you know. <laughs> and it kind of fit in too, you know. <laughs> dira dira, you know. <laughs> that was so fun. Yeah, so we uh there's, I, I can't remember all of the stories of Prabhupada. There's so many amazing stories of Srila Prabhupada. How he de dealt with so many challenges and so many things. In 1966, when the devotees wanted to really bring Prabhupada to the general public, they decided to hire a thick hall and then publicize Prabhupada and it's this Indian Swami who's come with the science of bhakti yoga. And so they put all these posters of Prabhupada's picture all over New York, all over Manhattan, and advertised as much as they could. And uh, when it came time for the program, seven people showed up. And, and Prabhupada spoke like there was 700 there. He, he was so enthusiastic. And at the end, the devotees said to Prabhupada, oh, Prabhupada, we're so sorry. Said, what do you mean? Narada Muni was here. Didn't you see? <laughs> and Prabhupada was serious. He was actually serious. Narada Muni had actually come. So Prabhupada never considered numbers to be a success. If there was one person there, he would preach like, it was like a hundred. And Bhakti Siddhanta used to say, if no one comes, preach to the walls, the four walls, they will hear you. He says, our business is to preach. It doesn't matter. Some will come, some won't come. But our business is to preach. We don't judge success by numbers. And, is, and that's also true. There was one story where one of our leading sannyasis he had arranged with one professor to come to his class and give a class talk. So the professor, he, uh, and it was a voluntary class, it was extra, so the students could come and just be there and hear. That was their own choice. So when uh, on that day, only one person showed up. And it was just the sannyasi, the professor, and one student. And, this, and the professor said, let's go to my office. So the three of them went to the office and then they had a discussion. That boy actually joined, that one boy. And he became one of the leading organizers of the Govardhan Echo Village. He's even now today, he's still there. He's, he's one of the most revered of the brahmacharis there, he's still there. Sanat Kumar, his name is. So that's an example of how Krishna consciousness works. You know, if you're enthusiastic, keeping that enthusiasm by 
and not judging things by material numbers like always. And people will come from you because you're enthusiastic. That's what really in, in really attracted me to Krishna consciousness. I saw that these people were really enthusiastic. They were whatever they were doing, they did it with such such attention, such energy, such happiness was really attractive like that. So if we can keep that mood amongst ourselves and be very enthusiastic that we can attract more and more people. Yeah. Like that. I have so many more stories, but I can't think of them. <laughs> Huh? Mine? I have one. Should I tell you that one? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's only a very... Believe it or not, I used to cook. <laughs> now you can't... Well, because of the lockdown, I was forced to go back to cooking, but... <laughs> Before then, I wouldn't go near a kitchen. <laughs> and so I used to be the head cook in the Brahmachari ashram, and I was the only cook, so I was the head cook. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I just gave myself that position. <laughs> I, thought it, I thought it fit, you know. <laughs> so... Uh, the news was Prabhupada was on his way to New Vrindavan. And I had developed this uh, cooking of para. I learned how to do para, you know, para, pira. And so I was making para for the deities. And I used to make just milk sweets a lot. That was my whole thing. Milk sweets, I used to do like what? Uh, koa, Sweet rice, burfi, para, like that. And Radhana Swami, we were together at the beginning. He would do sandesh. And Prabhupada really liked his sandesh. So it was time, and each person who could cook was asked to make something, and then we would take it to Prabhupada. So I thought, all right, I'll make some para for Prabhupada. So I was making para and making para. But it wasn't coming out right. And when it was done, I looked at it. I said, oh, it's all gooey, sticky. It was dark. And my other para was really light in color. and looked very nice. So I said, I can't give this to Prabhupada. So I put that aside. And... Uh, I thought, I'll just give them the ones that I'm going to give to Didi's. So I put, I said, I said these are for Prabhupada. But one day when they came around co to collecting the different foodstuffs to bring to Prabhupada, they were looking for me, but I wasn't around. So they thought, we can't wait. So they had to go, they went into the kitchen. And it was Radhana Swami at the time. He found the pair I made for Prabhupada. And he said, this is the one. And he gave it to the, it was Kirtananda Swami, and he, and they took that. When I came back, I said, oh no, Prabhupada's going to think, get this guy out of the kitchen, you know, <laughs> he can't cook. <laughs> so I was just lamenting. But Kirtananda Swami came back the other day, next day, and he said, you know, he said, Chandramali, <laughs> I saw Prabhupada do something I never saw him do before. He ate three of your paras, one after another. So I thought, yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> so I kind of evaluated that that's why I'm still here. <laughs> I got this special. They say if you do something to the spiritual master and it's pleasing, that's called special mercy. And that really locks you into Krishna consciousness. That will stay with you. 
there's one story where one devotee, he was a preacher, and he had opened up some places, and he actually opened up J J Tokyo, Japan, and other places. But when Prabhupada left the planet, he drifted away. And Prabhupada was really nice to him. He used to take care of him, taught him how to cook. And then when Prabhupada left, he left. And he was gone. And then he went back to his old ways again. And he started to engage in all kinds of sinful activity, especially taking drugs. So after some time, he got sick and he had got terminal cancer. And he decided to come back to Krishna consciousness at that time. So he came back and the devotees welcomed him back and they were trying to take care of him, knowing that he would leave any time. So they did. So he was laying in his bed and it was getting towards the end. And everyone was expecting him. He was going to go in any minute. And all of a sudden, when he was sitting in his bed, he looked, he turned to the door, his eyes got real big, and he said, Prabhupada, you've come! And that's the last thing he said. And he left his body. Prabhupada came to take him. Yeah. He did so much wonderful service for Prabhupada. Prabhupada never forgot that. Although he fell away, still, he got, this, he got that mercy that Prabhupada came and brought him back to Krishna, or else he took him wherever he was going. So that was Prabhupada's mercy. Yeah. So that's how it works. You know, that, you know, please the spiritual master by doing something. And that becomes, you become very dear to the spirit. The dear, the, all the disciples are dear to the spiritual master, but, but those who to those who preach, they become very dear. <laughs> those who preach become very dear. Okay. There are so many wonderful stories. Books have been written about the life of Srila Prabhupada. Like hundreds of books. Prabhupada traveled around the world. Is it time for Prashad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Okay. I have to give the Bhagavatam class tomorrow in Bhaktivedanta Manor. So I have to go tonight. <laughs> so I can't stay too late. But I, I would love to speak all night, but it's not going to work. Because <laughs> tomorrow's Rathi Yatra. Yeah. You all be there? Yeah. yeah. This is very special. So please come. If there's any comments or questions, anything about Srila Prabhupada or maybe your own experiences, Prabhupada changed the hearts of many people even after he left. There was a book fair here somewhere in, in Europe where one man, he came to our table, we had the book table, and he saw Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, he turned to his wife and he said, this is the man. He keeps appearing in my dream and he says, buy my Gita, buy my Gita. And so he bought the Gita. He never met Prabhupada. He was just getting dreams of Prabhupada. Prabhupada was telling him to buy the Gita. And he happened to come across the Gita. He bought it. Yeah. Yeah, and Prabhupada would sometimes appear in people's dreams or in their life in some way just to inspire them. Yeah. And then there was one lady, she also, some girl, she was nine years old, and she was at a book fair, she bought one of our books, I think it was Science of Self-Realization. 
And then when she brought it home, they were all Christians, and her, her grandmother said, give me that book, you can't read that. That's not our religion. And the grandmother read it somehow, even though she took it, and she became a devotee. <laughs> and she changed everybody, and she was forcing everybody to become a Hare Krishna. And she even made the, the dog a vegetarian. <laughs> Just by reading Prabhupada's books, you know. At first she was averse to the whole thing. So that was, that's Prabhupada, you know. He's still very much making this movement happen. He's very much alive. So we should take time and read his books and listen to his lectures and stay close to Prabhupada because when you, when you know Prabhupada, you know what Hare Krishna is. It's... It's coming from the Vedic culture, but Prabhupada has a certain style, certain mood that we should understand in order to understand how Krishna consciousness is it works or is applied. So it's important to really, really hear Prabhupada every day, read his books, and because Prabhupada is really the foundation for everything we do, everything we learn. Hare Krishna. And thank you very much. We'll go by Hare Krishna.